Welcome, brothers and sisters, to today's edition of our ongoing study on Course 108, The Church. First, brothers and sisters, we've done two lessons so far. Today is the third one, and this lesson today is extremely pivotal. Lesson three is institutionalization of the spirit of religion in the church. And if you understand what it means to institutionalize something, meaning it gets stuck root, it becomes so fixed, the result is no matter the amount of revival, the Holy Spirit is poured out, revival, maybe three months, maybe three years, it will better out. Why? You don't put new wine in old wine skins. And today's lesson, therefore, for you to truly understand this course, and we've not gone into the main course, we, we probably will begin tomorrow when we're going to the main course. What we are doing is to lay a foundation for us to understand, and I urge you to pay attention. Let us pray. Father in heaven, by your spirit, we come to the throne of grace. By the way of the blood, we come to receive from you that we may be empowered to get it right with the church in these end times. Have your way and glorify Yeshua. And let all things be done for his glory and praise in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. So, course 108, the church, lesson 3, institutionalizing the spirit of religion in the church. Listen very carefully. In a number of scriptures, Yeshua had warned what will happen to his church because of what Satan was doing. In Matthew 13, you remember very well, verse 24 to verse 30, verse 36 to verse 42 or 43, Yeshua has spoken about the tares, and it's now a buzzword, tares. But remember what he said, that while men slept, the enemy Satan will go and create a false church model. And it will be to deceive people, and the ultimate is to take people to hell. Because nothing can, there's no shorter distance to hell than to supposedly be in church and be in the jaw of the wicked one. Then Paul, the apostle, had spoken about the falling away in 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Some. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the Paul told Timothy, This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Then he began to articulate what it's all about, what will happen, the faithlessness, the treachery, all that. Then he ended in verse 7, saying, They'll be ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. And Jude. The half brother of Yeshua, just like James, wrote in Jude chapter 1 from verse 3. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Why? For there are certain men who have crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of Elohim unto lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God, and our Lord Yeshua, Jesus. Wow! He said, the reason he was writing, he says ungodly people have crept in to corrupt the church from inside out and turn it to nothing. And Peter also spoke of the dimension of the falling away, which had to do with making people to forget the coming of the Lord, forget the end times. And therefore, if you forgot the end times, you're going to live carelessly. Second Peter 3, this second epistle, Beloved, and I write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken of before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fall asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 
Yeah. And then, then people went about to say to people, you know, all this thing we've been waiting for 100 years, 200 years. When Peter wrote this, it wasn't even 100 years yet. 10 years, 50 years, say, oh, look at all this waiting is in vain. Let's go and enjoy ourselves. And I told them that, verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were of old, the earth standing water out of water. Then he told them that God doesn't count time like us. Brothers and sisters, in 1 John chapter 2, he said in verse 18, Little children, it's the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know it's the last time. They went out from us. People who, had, who were in church, they didn't have the spirit of Yeshua. They had the spirit of the Antichrist. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. But if they had been of us, you would have no doubt continued with us. So they went out. Brothers and sisters, listen. You would think that these people that have been described so far will just go out to become pagan worshippers, become atheists. You say that, you can say anything. No. They went out early in the gospel not to go into apostasy as in go to worship idols clearly for everybody to see. But they went out to do their own idea of church. So the body of Yeshua has faced real problem from the beginning. Problem outside. Problem within. And if you doubt this, in 1895 or thereabout, just about 70 years or so after Yeshua established the church in power on the day of Pentecost, which is about AD 27, not quite 70 years, Yeshua came to inspect his church as the auditor general of his own church. And as he went through the seven churches of Asia Minor, and I want you to read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, out of seven churches, five were found wanting. You do the arithmetic. Out of seven, five were found wanting. Only two, Smyrna, and Philadelphia passed the grade. And brothers and sisters, like I said, don't presume that when people leave the core of the truth, they go outwardly to go and do opposite. No. Most of the time, the tendency is to corrupt the world, redefine the world, and make it to suit humanistic interpretation. So, instead of, instead of what the Lord instituted, people will do what they want, of course, inspired by Satan, not really knowing it. And brothers and sisters, when you have time, read Revelation 2 and 3 to see what he said to the church in, some, in Ephesus, which lost his first love and went into religion, to see what he says about the church in Pergamon and the church in Thyatira, and the church in Sardis, which is saying, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. You are not connected to heaven. You are just barely breathing. You are in a comatose state. Or the church in Laodicea, where he says, listen, you say, you think you are rich. He said, you are empty. You are empty. Come and buy of me through gold. He said, you are naked. You are lukewarm. I'll spew you out of my mouth, brothers and sisters. This is within 70 years of the establishment of the church. Yeshua's report card on the church was terrible. Only two passed the grades. And if it is so, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the gangrene or cancer of error and negativity that has plagued the church is not a modern construct. It's as ancient as the early church. In fact, in the book of Revelation chapter 17, I urge you to go and read it, you know, because our time, we don't have enough time, and this is what is allocated today. Revelation 17 tells us a strange thing. John, remember the book of Revelation is about the future from that time. It's not something that has already happened, but what will happen? 
Yeshua was showing him what will happen. And part of it was what will happen to the church. A time will come. Revelation 17 verse 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, Come hither. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore. Whore is prostitute. That seated upon many waters. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of our fornication. They read the whole of it. You see that what John was about to describe was a union between the larger wing of the church and the world system. The world political system. The military industrial complex. The political powers of the earth reign. You know what? John was giving a picture of what had not yet happened, but will happen in the fourth century. One of the greatest revelations you can have is to have a revelation of what is called the mother mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Revelation 17 verse 8 to come to verse 5, to come to understand what it means the whole system, the one where church goes to bed with political leadership, are you not seeing it today? It is one of the most pro pre one of the most predominant moves across the earth, church and state, in cahoots, church and state, political and religious leaders marked together, having the same interest. We're going to see what this means, brothers and sisters. I want you to pay attention. So let's begin to see the manifestation of Revelation 17. The church had a checkered history. And just as in the seven churches of Asia Minor, Revelation 2 and 3, there will always be a remnant. Two churches were remnant. But the vast majority will always gravitate away from Yeshua, gravitate from his word, gravitate from his standard. In the same way, in the church, after the apostles, of course, you know, the apostles, for instance, the two most prominent apostles, the three most prominent, what happened to them? Peter was crucified upside down by Rome. Paul was beheaded by Rome. The same Roman Empire that its governor signed the death warrant of Yeshua, Pontius Pilate, before they could crucify him. The same Rome that tried to stamp out the gospel, did everything he couldn't. Brothers and sisters, the people in the church, the remnant could take it. As they got persecuted, they shed their blood. They were taken to Colosseum in Rome and many other sporting arenas. They put wild bulls, lions, and set them up to say, renounce Jesus. They say, no, how can we renounce our Lord? They open the, the, they, they open the, the pens and all those animals will come out and maul them and people will be hailing and laughing and drinking and enjoy the spectacle. The remnant, they were able to receive it. Some of them were burnt alive. They never recanted. They glorified the Lord. They witnessed a good confession. But the vast majority, two things happen to them. Where is, where is God to come and deliver us? Why is this persecution? So some of them began to be either backslide or apostatized, or some of them began to be open to anything. Then to what some matters, Yeshua said to them in their own kind of interpretation, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come to take you a better place. One year he hadn't come, two he hadn't come, three he hadn't come, ten he hadn't come, fifteen, twenty he hadn't come, thirty, forty. By seventy years after, someone like John the Beloved, they tried to kill him. Did everything. They even threw him into a pot of hot boiling oil according to church history. He didn't die because Yeshua had preserved him to show him a picture of the end time. And they took him and banished him to the island of Patmos. Brothers and sisters, that generation died out and others couldn't bear. Starting from the church fathers, some will compromise, some will stay through, some will go and write some terrible things. Some of the church fathers began to visit. After the apostolic, the initial apostolic age, some of the church pastors, fathers began to use their mind to 
frame the things of God, and before you know it, they begin to add salt, pepper. People like Polycar, people like um, Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, people like Athanasius, some of them had good things they got from the apostles. Some began to have some things. And listen to this. By the time the church had finished the first hundred years, second hundred years, the third hundred years, in the fourth century, something terrible happened. The larger wing of the church was tired of persecution, tired of not the, the non-return of Yeshua, and was ready, basically, for anything to save their skin. And so what happened? Here comes the Prince Charming, Emperor Constantine, whose mom was a Christian. But this man, if you want to know about him, go and study the biography of Emperor Constantine. He's a very significant figure. People don't tend to have time to study him. He, listen, he did great things for the church. But listen, in those days, once you, you get saved, you baptize publicly. But this man was not baptized. It was in his deathbed that they came to put some water upon him. And during his time, the city of Rome was filled with all kinds of statues to various gods. But this man had a soft spot for the Christians, so much so that he convened the Council of Nicaea. In fact, many people say with all certainty that he was really the first pope of the, of the Catholic Church, of the, uh, um, the, 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 the Catholic system. Because he wielded great power. He convened meetings, called the bishops, and he was under his patronage that the Council of Nicaea was held. But this man, in about between AD 310 and AD 311, he was able to convene, uh, convince Emperor Ly Lysinius. You know, there were two. Rome was now two parts Eastern Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire. So he was able to convince Emperor Lysinius. And two of them met in the city of Milan to sign what is called the Edict of Toleration. And by that Edict of Toleration in Milan, it meant that, you know what, Christians are no longer regarded as a cult, regarded as a outlaws. Please practice your faith freely. No more to be underground, because the remnant was underground. You know, and so, come out openly. You are now recognized. Practice your faith. And that wonderful development became the beginning of the end of the church as known. So you can say before 311, there was a church. After 311, there's a type of church. And let's now see that in the 4th century, look at what happened. One is the emergence of Emperor Constantine, whose mother Helena was a Christian as a champion of the church, even though he was not saved. Two, the edict of toleration signed took away persecution that the Lord had actually used to uphold the church, make it grow, because the more they killed the people, the more the blood of the martyrs was watering the ground, more revival. So that was taken away. And so the people began to feel now belonged. They need to settle, build houses, do this, do that. And the people began to go obey in the sense of worldliness. Three, by AD 381, under Emperor Theodosius, the, the, the deal was sealed. And what was the deal? The Roman Empire that crucified Yeshua, that tried to stamp out the gospel, Having tried everything and didn't succeed, rather the church was growing, the Roman Empire was getting to its final days because the Roman Empire, the real one, the powerful one, was to expire in AD 476. So 381 is getting close to that. So the wedding power, the Rome thought up a good idea. Why not let's just, not just tolerate them, why not let's just marry the church, let's be one, so that we can use it as an instrument of keeping the empire alive. And of course, the church leaders then, wonderful, with this now, we have the infrastructure of Rome to ourselves, we can expand, we can go to different nations, and that union, by AD 381, created a new reality. 
So the church of Yeshua ceased to exist that day, I mean that year, and came forth, what came forth? The church of Rome. Rome as a senior partner of the church. And you cannot marry a woman until you kick away the husband or kill her husband. So basically, what happened in 381 was that Yeshua was kicked out as the head of the church, as the groom of the church, and a new groom came in the Roman Empire. Brothers and sisters, these are historic realities. It's just the laziness of the church that we don't study historic documents. Some years ago, our family went on a search for where this edict was signed in Milan. And by the grace of the Lord, we found the ruins of a, of a palace that we believe was there, prayed over it, then we went to some other palaces in Milan. And I want to say this to you, the time has come for the church to revisit his body to show them the foundation so we need to understand that not the consequences we need to now look at the consequences of that let's remember the church as yeshua founded it the larger wing in 381 became married to a new husband a new boss a new leader a senior partner the the remnant went underground and the remnant preserved the truth. So what is the consequence of that union? Number one, emergence of Christian religion and its core motive. What is the core motive? It's called ABC churchianity. Churchianity. What is it? Attendance, building, cash. It's okay. Buildings where people go into. Attendance that fuels it. It doesn't matter the state of people. And then, of course, the money offering with which the church can build things and expand itself. Number two, the basis of religion was to supplant relationship with Elohim and substitute with rituals. So, religion trumped relationship. Three, religion is about rituals you perform inside designated buildings, church buildings. So, that became the new reality. Number four, on holy days and at designated times, Christians gather inside of church buildings, switch on church mode, and after one or two or three hours, they went back to their normal sinful life. Five days a week, they live their normal life. Prepare themselves on the sixth day, Confession, Sunday, they go back to, they go to church. After church, they go back to their normal way. So number five, life became divided as spiritual and secular. So some days are spiritual, some days are secular. Instead of the unified life that saints are supposed to live anywhere and everywhere, in secret and in open. So you had days, you switch on church mode. Number six, since the emperors and kings and nobles began to come to church as in a building on Saturday holidays, they need to invest in building beautiful structures, decorating them and making them attractive for the monarchs became imperative, both in Rome itself and all over the empire. So buildings became the norm and became church. Number seven, in order to match the pageantry, of the kings and nobles, you know, they normally dress in beautiful purple, scarlet, all that. They dress with all their caps and everything and their staff and, and they have the special throne set up for them even in church. In order to match them, those who minister to them could not be the simple and complicated people who look like Yeshua. We needed to go and resurrect the old, ironic Levitical priesthood resurrect it, that hierarchy, the high priest and all that, resurrect it with the robe, the colors, the purple, the scarlet, all that, so that you could match the pageantry of the royalty that were coming to church. So, number eight, the simple, uncomplicated priesthood of all believers that Yeshua gave to his church, you know, something had to happen to it. It had to give way to a strange construct whereby the ministers became a tiny professional clergy of overworked male clergy. 
which ministers to a large dormant laity. The clergy seat was up there on the altar, elevated, and the laity is down there in the pews, you know, bringing tithes and offering and being consumers of the anointing. Number, uh, number nine, instead of Holy Spirit leading and empowering the church, human reasoning took over, logic took over. So you began to plan. If you look at Romans chapter 8, it tells us from verse 4 to 9 that the carnal mind is enmity against Elohim. It cannot, it's not subject to Elohim and cannot be. And then we're told that in verse 14, as many as are led by the spirit of Elohim, they are the sons of Elohim. So Holy Spirit was chased out of the church. Human beings began to sit down with their fertile minds, begin to plot graph how to go church, how to get church to all this location, to that city, to that city, all in the realm of the human mind. Brothers and sisters, number 10, the Holy Scriptures in the same way were discarded because there is liberation in the world. If people study the world under the ocean of Holy Spirit or understanding, they will maintain their relationship with the Lord. So what happened? Holy Spirit Scriptures were jettisoned and in its place began to create dogmas and traditions of men which people needed to learn, memorize, recite. It became creda rather than the word becoming flesh. Number 11, an apex hierarchical structure with a supreme leader needed to be created to replace the fivefold. Because if there's fivefold, people will be empowered, they will know who they are, they will know who, they know their king, and they'll be able to flow. So took out the fivefold, created all that power, put it into the hand of one person called the supreme leader. And then at the level of the diocese or archdiocese, the, archdiocese, the archbishop, the bishoprics, the bishop, then the parish priest, one priest, this there, apex leader. Brothers and sisters, and the problem with all revivals, the Lord was telling me this morning, the problem with all revivals and moves of Holy Spirit is that the church tends to forget what Yeshua said. Luke 5, 36. And he spoke unto them a parable. No man put a piece of a new garment upon an old. Let's say this is an old one. You take this one and join. You see, this one is clear. You join it to this one. What will happen? Otherwise, then bought the new make it a rent, and the peace that was taken out of the new agreed not with the old. It can't stand. Any little pressure, it tears off, both here and there. And he said again in verse 27, No man put a new wine in old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. The new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. So this cause on the church, the kingdom church, this course is designed to enable us to understand the infrastructure, the superstructure, the content of the church that Yeshua gave clearly in the Bible and how he wanted his church to operate. I want you to understand, if it is so, we must, we must go beyond the last 1700 years and get right back to Yeshua's time and the time of the Alpha Church to discover what did he say his church would be, how did his disciples, how did Paul the Apostle, the master builder of the church say it would be, and all these diversions are falling away, especially from the second century, the third century, to the fourth century, those terrible 300 years, all the errors and the things that have happened since then we are going to go all the way. This is not radical. This is life. If you're going to obey the Lord, obey Him completely. You don't want to obey Him, that's no problem. He will not force you. The one thing for sure is that the Lord wants to enable this generation. The Lord believes there is a remnant He can bring to a point where He, the, he can use them to bring for the church without spot or wrinkle or other such things. And if you are now a part of that, may grace help us not to be ashamed of Yeshua. May grace help us. And there's something else I needed to say 
in number 12 item of the outcome of all that is that people no longer needed to encounter Yeshua of the old rugged cross where their life is changed totally. No, you can come to church without being saved. And even today, you see people do signs and wonders they were not saved. Brothers and sisters, these 12 things bear them in mind. By way of assignment, please provide five things you learned from this lesson. As a person, what are the five things you learned generally? Two, kindly indicate any five scriptures which we cited that, you know, touched you personally. Three, out of the 12 outcomes of Christian religion, which six provide the greatest insight for you? And you know what? We love you dearly. Strap your seat belt to listen to what the Lord will say to us from his Holy Scriptures. And as Holy Spirit expounds it, so that if you have opportunity, but I'm determined, brothers and sisters, that every bit of mystery Babylon, I'm going to come like the Jews do chapters, you know, what they do when they are looking for the cedar, when they are marching, they are looking for every level in the house. I am determined that any level of any type must be located and repented, renounced, and taken away. And I want to ask you, will you join me on this quest? Let's go into a journey, into the Holy Scriptures. Let's discover what the Lord has for us. Let us pray. Father, let your name be glorified. By your Spirit, Lord, save us. Save us from error. Save us from lies. Empower us to know your truth that sets free. And raise up a, a group of people you can use, like Gideon, to tear down the altars of Baal. Have your way, Father. Help us in every way to be who you want us to be. Thank you for answering our prayer. We we'll give you praise, O oh Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Please, I want to encourage you. Share this video. This is profound. If you can understand this truth, the Lord is going to use us mightily. And I feel it press in my spirit that the Lord wants to go further than anything he shared with us. And you know what? We're going to show you how even the Protestant movement missed God, missed the Bible, missed the scriptures. So we can take away the old wine skin and get the white skin of truths. Before I leave, remember this memoir. It's useful because it gives you an idea of what can happen if you encounter the old rugged cross. The memoir of Pastor Grace, his glory goes with us. Go to www.assuringgrace.org and download your copy and study. Tomorrow, we're going to meet again. Share this video and let's do it together. Thank you, Pastor Grace.